I'm Michael Wells, and I was invited to, to come along as a sort of um, paid extra. Uh, but let me f- tell you just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in London, in Islington, long, long before it became fashionable. Grew up as part of a small family and part of a local church. It was the sort of church where you went and you heard 45-minute sermons on Habakkuk. Yes. (laughs) I survived. Trained for leadership within the church, went into the teaching profession, got all sorts of various jobs. So I've worked as an evangelist with Script Union. I've worked as a museum educator. I've worked as a research assistant. I've worked as a teacher. And... um, I'm currently a full-time grandfather and part-time domestic goddess. (laughs) And this is our daughter, Carolyn. And we want to talk a little bit about how we help today's generation develop faith. But the reason for my telling you a bit about myself is you need to understand that all of us are products of all our prejudices and experiences. This young lady, I think I'm still allowed to say that, grew up in my family. So you may see some similarities for which I apologize. But I'm going to hand over to to her and um, she's going to help focus a bit on the very sort of basics. And my chair's over there, isn't it? It is, yeah. Okay, so I'm Carolyn and um, I was invited as his sidekick, um, mainly because I work at the Oxford Centre for Youth Ministry as a tutor there. And at Oxford CYM, we are absolutely passionate about empowering the church and people within the church to engage with children and young people. And that's why you're here, because you share that passion. And represented in this room are lots and lots of families. So, let's have a little think about those families. I have three gorgeous children. Not that I'm at all biased. Um, And and I do talk about them quite a lot, actually, don't I, Ollie, in lectures and things. They're great (laughs) examples of what goes on. Um, What I want you to do is to very briefly tell me a little bit about your children, um, the ones that you're here for. They may be your um, own children, they may be your grandchildren, they may be other children in the church family that you have a real heart for. Now, because there are so many of us here, although I'd love to hear your stories, we're going to do it in a very classroom style. I'm going to say an age, and you're going to put a hand up if you've got a child of that age range. Now, there are two reasons for doing that. The first is because when we put our hand up in worship, we are celebrating all that God is. When we put our hand up and represent those children of those different ages, we are celebrating all that God has done, all that God has given us in those incredible people. The second reason is so that as we talk, we've got an idea of what ages you're representing so that we can actually tailor what we say to your needs rather than talking about children that you don't have or um, talking about ages that have been and gone. So, I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to start with 18. Anyone representing any 18-year-olds? Okay. Lovely. Mm. Yeah, grandchildren. Okay, 17. I've got one of those. You've got one of those. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. 16. No 16. Oh, one 16-year-old. Yeah. I say they could be children that you've just got a heart for. You don't have to be related for them. 15. Yeah, I've got a 15. You've got a 15 as well. (laughs) 14, 13, 10, oh no, I see, how about 12, (laughs) not very good at numbers, 12, okay, a few more, 11, 10, 9, more, 8, 7, Lots of sevens. Six. 
five, four, three, two, one. Okay, lovely. Okay. Well, that doesn't help us any. Because <laughs> we've got children and young people from all of the age. I think we do cluster a little bit about 10 to 8 and the sort of 4 to 5. Um, the plan of the evening is that um, we're going to talk for um, a little while about some of the, um, the sort of theory, the theology of um, children and working with children within a family context. Um, and um, then we are going to have a break, you can get another drink, go and queue for the toilet, um, and then we're going to come back and we're going to think about some how-tos. Um, one of the things I say to the students all the time is, when you're looking at a theory, you need to ask the question, so what? And so after the break, we're going to be asking questions, so what? It's all very well in theory, but in the real world, how do I, as a mum, how do I as a dad, how do I as an uncle, how do I as a grandparent, actually foster the faith and the spirituality of the children that I'm connected with. So, this hopefully will not keep going off because we will be using it. Um, and it's just a guide with some pictures. Ooh, there's a hole there. Some pictures to um, focus our thinking. So, let's just start off. Hello. Hello. Oh, hang on. Bear with me a second. I think it wants to go backwards. See this amazing technology, and you're going to get a sneaky preview backwards. And I want to, at the break, I want to do a little quiz <laughs> on what you think all the pictures represent. It does make you feel a bit sick if it goes quickly. I'm sorry. Now you've all guessed what's happening and you're thinking, oh, right, okay, I know that bit, I know that bit. <coughs> there we go. That's where I wanted to be with my pictures <coughs> of trees. So we have a picture of a Christmas tree, all decorated and beautiful, ready to celebrate Christmas. And we have a picture of a little sapling. Why do you think I've put those two pictures up there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, definitely Christmas is a time that I think has been a bit ambushed, hasn't it? Um, and actually, how do we reclaim that for the children that um, we're working with? Any other ideas? Yeah. Little saplings grow up and become great big trees, don't they? But when they're little saplings, they're quite vulnerable, which is why they put those wire frames around them. The tree that is decorated for Christmas looks fab. I'm a little bit obsessed with Christmas. My tree is always decorated beautifully. Even though I'm empowering my children by letting them decorate it themselves, as soon as they've gone to bed, I resort it. But the Christmas tree dies. It looks resplendent for a couple of weeks, and then because it's got no roots, it dies, and the needles fall off, and the decorations start to fall off because the branches are drooping. A sapling grows because it has roots, and that's what draws up the nutrients and the water and gives it life. What we're looking for when we're thinking about discipling children is saplings, not Christmas trees. Although I love Christmas trees, we don't necessarily want a child that knows all of the books of the Bible in reverse order and can name all of the disciples and all of the saints. What we want is children who've got roots, children who are able to draw the nutrients of a relationship with Christ into their lives. And that's one of the things that we're exploring this evening. It's a child. We were all children. The trouble is, some of us have forgotten what it was like to be children. We've got so preoccupied with, with other things. And also, we, we have this sort of ideal of childhood. We think of 
children as sort of wonderful little babies, as delightful toddlers, of amazing bright-eyed nine-year-olds, of keen athletic 13-year-olds, of very intelligent, hard-working 16-year-olds. Mm -hmm. But, well, you only have to walk around the local supermarket to see that that's not quite true. Our children may be perfect, but everybody else's are somewhere on the scale going down. And one of the problems within the church is that we've often got hijacked with this idea that children are wonderful, perfect, never do anything wrong. And we get upset and embarrassed and feel failures. But um, last time I was in this church building, it was a very special day for, for our whole family, which I'll tell you all about some other time. But um, we were here for the mysteries. And one of my favorite characters was leaping around, being a complete fool, Noah. Noah, the most ineffective, useless evangelist ever. <laughs> and what of his family? We don't know much about them, except that one of them showed great disrespect. And Noah's one of the key figures. Let's think, too, of... Um, Yes, Abraham, wonderful, friend of God, father of a legitimate child who he abandoned. Hmm. Jacob, the twister and cheat who lied to his own father. And then, you know what happened to the rest of his family. And right back at the very beginning of time, there was even Adam with that murderer son. So let's disabuse ourselves of the idea that somehow there is an ideal child that is what we're aiming for. About 20 odd years ago when Carolyn was a baby, um, I went for an interview for a teaching job. It was a deputy head of a small school. And during the interview I was asked, you know, are you ambitious? And I was naive because I said, well, I've achieved my greatest ambition now. I'm married and I've got a child. And that child was so important. There's some pictures lurking around of me standing in my camel-coloured duffel coat in a City of London cemetery with this baby that nobody else had ever had. But one of the things that my wife Leslie and I did right from the very beginning was that we gave our children back to God and let God take responsibility for them. It didn't mean that we didn't feed them, we didn't clothe them, we didn't tell them stories, but it meant that we weren't carrying that burden. And sadly, there are lots and lots of parents who carry burdens. Now, Daughter, stand up. Yes, sir. Can you remember one of the first ever Christmas presents you received? <laughs> A suitcase. <laughs> yes. yes. How old were you? Four, I think. And then I got one for my 16th birthday as well, which was a bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and with those suitcases came what? Permission to go. Yes. I think. Yeah. Thank Permission you. to go. Um, our, our children are a gift, and they're a very precious gift, but they're one that we need to hold on to lightly, because if we hold on to them tightly, then they'll struggle um, to go. Children are part of a family, but more importantly, children are part of a tribe. And that's why at the beginning, I said to you, what about the children that are on your heart that you're not related to. Um, I've been working until last Sunday as a children evangelist for my church. And um, one of the things that um, struck me in my period of leaving is um, the, the relationship I have with many adults. One of my first explorers became a doctor. She graduated as a doctor this week. What, what a huge privilege to be part of her life for that long. Now, I'm not her parent. Um, she wasn't in my groups all of the time. 
but I'm part of her tribe. And we are part of God's tribe on earth. In the way that we heard about um, Abraham and the, the family that he created, we're part of that. And sometimes I think we um, are encouraged by society to be a nuclear family, to be two parents and 2.2 children and a Volvo and a Labrador. And if we can manage that, then we're okay. The reality is that many, many families do not have two adults as part of them. Um, and yet, that, although that was God's original design, it doesn't have to be a failure because we are all linked in this tribe. And we can step into roles and other people can step into the gaps that we leave. Parenting, I really passionately believe, is a team sport. My 17-year-old is really struggling with her faith at the moment. And we don't have a youth worker at our church. And um, when we were having a conversation the other day, and she was having a little bit of a strop about it, um, I knew that I needed to back off. <laughs> that actually the things that she wanted to say, she couldn't say to mum. And the things that she wanted to say, she couldn't say to mum, who's done theological training. Um, and the things that she wanted to say, couldn't say to mum, who worked for the church. Um, I needed somebody else to have that conversation with, with her. Now, we're very fortunate that the person who was the youth worker comes to our house regularly um, for respite care. And, um, and so he said, that's my job. Um, I'm part of that, that tribe. So there are times when we need to take responsibility for other people's children as well as our own. But that doesn't mean that we get completely off the hook. We hold that gift lightly, we share the load, we share the responsibility, but we do have a responsibility. But it's a duty of care because of love, not a burden as was described earlier. So when it comes to faith, what are we wanting for our children? I was saying, Joe, this morning, wasn't I? Was it you I was talking to you this morning about this? I think it might have been. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, many years ago, in one of the groups that I ran, I had a brother and sister. And um, they came from a lovely church family. And um, they used to come along to my Explorer group, which was 7 to 11s, and then to the 11 to 14s. And I really worried about them. Because although they did have the head knowledge... I felt very strongly that they didn't have the heart knowledge. That although they could tell me all sorts of facts about the Bible, about Jesus, they knew all the answers when I asked questions to see if people had listened to the story, they didn't actually have the heart knowledge. They didn't know Jesus as a friend. And so I think when we're talking about faith development, for children we are talking about knowing Jesus as a friend. Um, sometimes um, we talk about, uh, in human development, we talk about the fact that um, under the age of about eight, children are very concrete thinkers. They're not able to think in abstract. So if you said, said to an eight-year-old, invite Jesus into your heart, chances are their response is, I can't, he won't fit. Because they have heard that their heart is a muscle somewhere about here. And they're very concrete thinkers. It's important that we talk about Jesus, the miracle maker. It is important that we talk about the Holy Spirit. But we need to be thinking about the language that we're using so that we're phrasing it in a way that they understand. And so when we say to a child, have you got faith? That might not mean anything, unless they've got a friend called Faith, um, and then they might have um, Faith. There's a guy who wrote um, a theory of faith development called Westerhoff, and what he said was that Faith, if somebody has Faith, they have it. But just like the sapling, it might be very thin. 
But as that person grows and develops, so their faith develops like the rings of a tree. And if you were to cut, well, you can do this literally, I'm still in my concrete mine. If you were to cut that person in half at the end of their life, you would see ring after ring after ring of faith. So that was his um, analogy. The, The other part of his theory was that at stages we reach a crisis... And then that's when we move on to the next stage. And he came up essentially with four different phases. And he said the first phase of faith is experiencing. I cannot love unless I have been loved. In that cemetery, I don't remember that cemetery, but my every cell of my being and my heart remembers that cemetery because I know that I was loved. I know that I am loved. And because of that, I can then give love to my children. So our faith for our babies and for our little people is centered on whether they experience love. Then Fowler says the next stage is belonging. That actually we need to belong to a community of faith in order to have faith. Now, if you've done any work with eight-year-olds, you will know that they are pack animals. Yes, and if one of them puts their hand up for something, then everybody else will as well. Yeah, if one of them says, I don't like that, then nobody will do that. They are very much in that stage of development where what other people think is really important. And it doesn't actually stop, does it, until they become, what, 23? I don't know. We haven't got out of it yet. Um, But it's really important that they belong. When we moved from that place in London to another place in London, when I was about three, um, we were part of a church where we had the person that I still call the best vicar in the country. We were only in that church for under two years. And yet Norman, who still sends me a Christmas card, um, used to walk up the aisle and I'd stand at the pew at the end and he'd wink at me as he went up. Now, as an adult, I know that he winked at every single child who was at the end of the pew. But as a three-year-old, I thought I was the most special person on the planet. And when he stood up in the pulpit with his hippopotamus, what was the hippopotamus called? Bracken the dog. Bracken the dog, yes. Um, I listened to every word that he said because he'd made me feel like I belonged. So when we are part of our tribe... What are we doing to help our children feel that they belong and helping other children to feel that they belong as well? We have quite a lot of hanger honors in our family. I have a seven-seater car on the grounds that there are always other people coming. And one of the things that I've realized over time is that actually for them, belonging to our family is really important. And it's really interesting that when we line up for communion, we're an Anglican church and we do line up and and all of that, that uh, sometimes our children aren't with us, they're with other people in the tribe, and sometimes we have children join our family. And that's what we're aiming for, that sense of belonging. Um, When Jesus was at the temple, his parents didn't realize until an awfully long time after they'd left Jerusalem. Because the community lived and worked and traveled together. And they knew that somebody was looking after them. Well, that's what they assumed anyway. Um, but you see what I'm getting at, that idea of looking out for each other. Sometimes people are ill. Sometimes people are bereaved. Sometimes people struggle to talk to their children about various things. Where can we fill that gap? Thirdly, we've got searching. And this is the stage of faith. Uh, Sorry, just trying to remember the passcode. Yes. Yeah, you all know it now. Yeah, it's okay. (laughs) It's all right. My children cracked it within two hours of me having the password on there. Um, Yes, searching is where 
um, they're asking questions. And for many of us, this can be a really difficult and painful time as a parent. As I say, my 17-year-old is really struggling at the moment. She has no idea the heartbreak that her struggle is causing me as her mum because it's not my job to give her that heartbreak. It's my job to stand alongside her while she questions because I trust that my God will bring her through. But I stand in church sometimes knowing that she's not singing the songs. I stand in church sometimes with her whispering a theological debate about the sermon. Um, and that's my job, is to do that. So, but it's important that she asks the questions. Because if she doesn't ask the questions, how is she going to move into Westerhoff's final stage of faith, which is owning it for ourselves? Yeah, we have to ask the questions and we have to allow children the opportunity to experience doubt. If you don't have doubt, you won't have faith. Yeah, so we've got to allow them to do that. This model has turned those circles, those tree rings on its side and said, actually, all of us go through a cycle and our children will go through a cycle. You might have a fervent, religious three-year-old who will not eat anything unless it has been sanctified, um, who um, baptizes all of their teddy bears every night, um, who insists on 45 minutes worth of bedtime prayers. It's a con. Um, they just don't want to go to sleep. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, and they are absolutely there 100%. And they are there 100%. They do own that faith. But they might go through another cycle. Um, one of the reasons why I came up with this idea was, um, oh gosh, how many years ago? Nine years ago, my best friend died. Um, she left behind three children and a baby and a husband. And um, it was a sudden heart attack. Um, she'd been one of the most healthy person on the planet. Her only sin was haagen ice cream. She cycled everywhere. She didn't drink. She didn't smoke. And she dropped dead of a heart attack. I was a bit cross with God. <laughs> Particularly as she had the heart attack on the Thursday. And they didn't actually turn the machine off till the Tuesday. And I had to lead the service on the Sunday. Um, and our church family wept and prayed and prayed for Jo to get better. And she didn't. She died. They turned her off. And I went through this cycle. But actually, it was the belonging to the church family that mourned with me and held me whilst I cried that took me through. It was the questioning that allowed me to not necessarily find sensible answers. There aren't any sensible answers to an experience like that. But allowed me to find a space for my non-answers and a way of, of resting in God's presence and trusting that when I get there, um, if I need to, he'll tell me a little bit more. One of the significant moments in that, though, was when I was in a school and I was doing um, one of my favorite types of RE lessons, which is where the children ask the questions. And the reason it's great is because you can say whatever you want because the child has asked the question. You, it's not like, you, you know, you can't stand up and say Jesus is the only answer because. But if a child ans asks you a question, you can respond as a Christian I. So we had this RE lesson. And uh, one of the children, and I was doing quite well, as you know, it was a couple of weeks after the death, I was okay, I was on my feet, and I was doing all right. One of the children said to me, do you ever get angry with God? I had a choice then. I could have said, no, no, not really, and carried on. I could have fallen down on the floor and sobbed for England. Or I could have actually been really honest with them. And that's what I chose to do. I said, yes, actually, right now, I'm really, really, really cross with God. Didn't tell them why, but I said, I'm really, really cross with God. And then as I'm talking, I said, yes, but I think that it's a bit like this. 
You see, when my two-year-old gets in a tantrum, I pick her up and I hold her and I hold her and I hold her until she stops. And I think that that is what God is doing with me when I get angry. I don't know what response the children had, but I knew at that point that that was a really significant moment for me. When we are discipling our children, we need to be honest with them. We need to say, I don't know, I don't understand. We need to say, it doesn't make any sense. We need to acknowledge the fact that life hurts and that things are difficult. But in that honesty, God honors our trust and our faith and our ability to communicate with that children. So it's not saying, I don't understand, therefore there is no God. It's saying, I don't understand, thank goodness there is a God who does. Do you see what I mean? The difference between uh, a questioning that provides despair and a questioning that allows us to have that hope. And so as our children go through this spiral, we will see them moving closer to Jesus and sometimes moving in what feels like further away. But as long as they're moving through that cycle, eventually um, they'll, get, they'll get there. Um, and one of the things that um, I'd really like you to explore in one of the breaks is where you think your children are. Are they experiencing? Are they actually so much part of a lively Bible-based group that they're experiencing a fantastic understanding of Jesus? Are they belonging to the family by running around the church building? Are they searching for answers? Are they owning that stage of the faith that they are at now? We cannot have faith if we don't have spirituality. Um, I put a capital S on that because we're working in a Christian context and we're talking about Christian faith development. But I do believe that spirituality with a small s is a human capacity. Um, That actually we are all physical, mental, emotional, spiritual beings. And um, a few years ago I did some research on spirituality and in particular children's spirituality. Up until about... 15 years ago, children's spirituality didn't exist. Or rather, children's spirituality did exist. No one had written a book about it. Um, And then Rebecca Nye and David Hay started to explore children's spirituality. And suddenly, people who knew that children are spiritual beings were given permission to say, ah, yes, we see that on a regular basis. Spirituality is um, often a tricky subject when you're talking with in a church context. Um, Some people think um, that anything that is spiritual and not Holy Spirit um, is dodgy, is new age and things like that. Um, Please let me be clear that I do think there are boundaries to spirituality. There are expressions of spirituality that are not healthy and are not of God. But I think there are also expressions of spirituality that aren't necessarily within a Christian framework have an essence of God in them. And if you look at the word spirit, it comes from God's breath. It's that idea of God breathing into us. There are hundreds of definitions of spirituality, but um, essentially it's about um, connection with self, other by which we would say God, the world around us, and other people. So connection with um, ourselves, God, others, and the world around us. And in descriptions of spirituality, you'll hear words like awe and wonder, or mystery, 
or um, a sense of well-being, um, a sense of um, meaning and purpose. And so when children are exercising their spirituality, some of it is innate and natural. How many of you did a school run this morning? Anyone did a school run this morning? Okay, was it raining? Or is that just a stupid question? Okay, so what happened on the school run then? It wasn't raining. <laughs> Did any of the children you were with look at the sky? Yeah, yeah, okay. But that is an expression of a child's spirituality, isn't it? At this moment, the sun is shining, therefore, it is a sunny day, yeah? But as adults, we say, yes, but take your Mac just in case or take your wellies just in case. We're very pragmatic, aren't we? We're very sort of practical and things like that. Did any of them see snails? Because it's been raining, snails and worms on the path. Did any of you see any crushed snails on the path? Yeah? How many people stopped and looked at crushed snails? Crushed worm, yes, yeah. Okay. It's fascinating, isn't it? Now, in the scheme of things, when you've got shopping to do and other bits and pieces to do, a crushed worm is not important. But for a child, it's really interesting. And it does fill them with awe and wonder. We might go, ugh, but actually for them, it does. And as we help them to explore their spirituality, these are the kind of things that we should be encouraging. Not that we go, oh, another crushed worm, another crushed worm, another crushed worm. But actually pause and give them space for those moments. So that when they do look up at the sky and go, it's a sunny day, we can look up with them and go... It's a sunny day, even if it is only sunny for that five minutes. When they look at the crushed worm, they, and they go, oh, how did it get like that? We can wonder with them, well, maybe, maybe it was a big, giant worm crusher. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a centipede that was wearing wellies. Yeah? I wonder, I wonder how it got like that. I wonder where it was going when it got crushed. I wonder if it's got babies that are waiting for it to come home. Yeah. We start to make, yes, yes, it gets very, very tearful. <laughs> <laughs> we do actually want them to get to school at some stage. <laughs> but can you see what I mean about that sense of actually just seeing those little glimpses of spirituality? And rather than our natural tendency to shut it down and move on, actually experience it with them. There does come a point, however, when they go, oh, mom, you're just so embarrassing. Um, so at that stage, you just have to go with that and stop looking at everything on the road or, or as you drive past going, oh, bunnies, or whatever it is that you see. Yeah. Cows. Yeah, mom, yeah. <laughs> so... As I was thinking about spirituality, um, I came up with this theory, and um, it's sort of, because I'm quite a physical person, it has uh, my hands that are slightly overlapping, so my fingers are splayed, and my hands are slightly overlapping to show a spectrum. And at one end, I think there is a very female approach to spirituality, and at the other end, I think there's a very masculine approach to spirituality. Now, only being female myself, I know more about that end of the spectrum. But I think what we've done in our society is separate masculine and feminine. When only 16 years ago, when I bought Bethany's pushchair, we bought a pushchair. And it was blue. But it was, you know, a sort of navy blue. Now, when you buy a stroller, you buy a pink one or you buy a blue one. You buy a boy's version or you buy a girl's version. Lunch boxes, yeah? Boys' lunch boxes, girls' lunch boxes. Now, my son is a very manly 11, almost 12-year-old, but he likes pink. So why can't he have 
a pink lunchbox because society has separated the gender. And I think we've also done that in the church. And I think what we've done in the church is said, these are the ways that you relate to God. You stand and you sing Jesus is my boyfriend songs and then you sit and you drink coffee and you chat and you do quiet coloring. Yeah? Um, but anything else that involves running around or um, asking questions or, or being a bit physical isn't spiritual. Now, I disagree with that. I think that spirituality is a physical endeavor. I, as I say, I'm a physical person. I'm one of those people who, if I go into a shop full of nice things, I am known to stroke them. Yeah. Um, or even smell them if they're very, very beautiful. Because for me, that's part of their beauty is the touch and the smell of them. And I'm a little bit like most eight-year-old boys, actually. They want to touch it. They want to smell it as well. So whilst I was doing this thinking and the, about this spectrum, I came up with this idea of what I called spiritual connections. And um, they are ways that we engage with and are express our spirituality. They're not a replacement for faith, but they are a way in. Yeah? They're a way of helping us to engage with God and his wonder and his creation. I came up with 20, um, but we kind of moved it down um, to 10 that are particularly important, I feel. And the first one is relationship. It goes in, along with what I was saying about belonging and being um, part of that community. It also, it's also about conversation as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that and story in a minute. Um, play. I discovered in the research that I did that play was actually not a connection in its own right. It was something that was part of every single way that we do. We play with words, we play with ideas, um, we play with each other, we play on our own. Um, we, we do all sorts of forms of play when we, are a when we are children. And that can be a very spiritual activity. It can be an access into what we're doing. And I'm going to ask MJ in a bit to talk about um, a group that we've started, um, which is very much based on free play. Um, Story, we're going to talk about that later. Pain and loss. As I say, my own experience taught me that although it's not, a, it's not a thing that we want for our children, it can be a time of growth and of change. And a time when we ask those key questions. Um, when my daughter Holly was diagnosed with epilepsy, um, she sat me down one day and said, why has God allowed this to happen? Um, um, theological training out the window. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know. And then I could tell her what I do know about her God who loves her and created her and who has provided all these wonderful people around her who love her and cherish her. But she was asking that question. And so one of the reasons why we keep pets is so that they die. I know it's the tragic truth, but that's what we do. Because actually that's the point at which a child will often ask those big questions. And we can use them to help them think about that meaning making and purpose. I don't remember what the next one was. Humor. Humor. Oh, yes. Humor is, um, I think, a spiritual connection. And... Um, the reason I think is, have you ever been so hysterical that you've kind of lost all sense of where you're at? You know, when you just, particularly if you're in a place where you're not supposed to be laughing, and, and you just can't, and it's like this physical thing, isn't it? And, you know, it doesn't matter, and you've completely forgotten what it was you were laughing about in the first place, but all you have to do is catch the eye of the other person that's laughing, and that's the thing, isn't it? That actually humor is often a very communi community thing. That we, as a group, we laugh. Um, if you ever notice um, on television programs, when the comedians are live, people laugh louder. Because they're there in a crowd and they're, they're experiencing that. For children, 
they laugh, I can't remember the statistics, something like children laugh something like 200 times a day and an adult laughs less than 20. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that tragic? Isn't that tragic? But isn't that wonderful for them? And isn't it that is an opportunity for us to explore that? I see Jesus as being this person who laughed a great deal. He did tell some jokes, I think, um, in his, his storytelling and stuff. I, and I think God has got a sense of humor. I mean, why giraffes and elephants and all sorts of other things that I could name in his creation that I think he went, ha, <laughs> ha, they'll enjoy that. Um, <laughs> And, and so why can't we celebrate that with our children? I think sometimes we, we treat church and faith as very, very serious. But actually, the Bible is full of some really funny stories. Solomon was doing a poo in a cave. Saul. That's funny. Saul, sorry, Saul. I had the right <laughs> lineage. Yeah, Saul was doing a poo in a cave. And David could have killed him. Now, can you imagine what the Daily Mail would have made of that headline? Yeah? That's funny. People fall off chairs in the Bible. People uh, meet donkeys that talk. Um, there's all sorts of funny things that are going on. And children see that and they know that. So let's encourage that rather than shut it down for them. Music and creativity is kind of obvious in itself. We know that children love to make a noise and they love to, to make things. Thinking is perhaps a little bit less obvious. Children spend a lot of time thinking, or at least we did when we were children, when we didn't have things that we could plug into, when we didn't have screens on 24-7, when we didn't have masses of homework and expectations from us. One of the things that I think our children are having stolen from them is time to think. One of the places that we lived was in a farm a million miles from anywhere. And I used to go and sit on a gate and watch the sunset. And I don't think I had any great thoughts at that point, but I did have thoughts. And I did have time to work out who I was. I did have time to wonder at God's creation and, and try and find my place in that. I had that opportunity to think, and we really need to give our children time to think. And that includes time for silence as well. I know how hard it is to get your children to take the things out of their ears and listen to you having a conversation about tomorrow, let alone about encouraging them in silence. But how can we be creative in making spaces for ponderings, spaces for thinking, spaces for quiet in their lives? Service. Um, children like to do things for other people. And that helps them belong. It helps them matter. So even if they are just setting the table or um, putting the shoes neatly or a little job, that is part of saying, you belong here. You're part of what makes this family work. Risk is something that I could go on for hours and hours, but I'm aware that we're starting to get towards our break. Um, risk is something, again, I think we've stolen from our children. We are so safety conscious that we don't allow them to experience risk. And if you don't go to the edge then you are not going to have that moment of this could all end here or what next, where, how, why. Yeah. When we lived on this farm, there was a stream down the road and my brother and I, during the summer holidays, would take jam jars and we would go to the stream and we would catch fish all day. And then when we were hungry, we would go home. Because that was quite normal. Now, when my son was in year six, we live round the corner from the junior school. I mean, literally round the corner from the junior school. And as he got to the end of year five, beginning of year six, I'm like, right, you're old enough. 
to walk yourself there. First day, I walked with him to the corner, saw him across the road. Second day, I didn't walk with him, I walked behind him, looked. Um, third day, I stood at the window trying to peer. We live round the corner. But I've been so inbred by society that at some stage between my house and 100 yards down the road, he's going to get molested by a paedophile or kidnapped or run over or we're so scared of things that aren't going to happen to our children that we have taken away something really important for them. When you get frightened, you ask for God. Even people who do not believe in God, when they are frightened, ask for God's help. Yeah? So if we don't allow our children to take it to the next degree, to be a little bit frightened, to be a little bit beyond where they're in control, then we're going to damage that spirituality, damage that opportunity to go, okay, I'm not in control here, but I trust and I have faith in a God who is. Story. And the last one on the list was technology. Yes, it but, was, um, but I couldn't remember what it was. That, that's the, the next research project. Yeah. Unfortunately, both of our children grew up with a mother who was and still is addicted to computers, Ooh. so they really don't stand a chance. Her latest project is developing apps for um, mobile phones, I think. <laughs> Part of what Carolyn was talking about is encapsulated in this particular book, Slugs and Snails and Puppy Dog Tales. No dead worms, I'm afraid. We brought some copies with us, along with some of the, the youth work books. You're welcome to have a look at, and if you feel you want to invest in one, then we will happily take the money off you. Um, as Carolyn said, this came out of her research and her interest in spirituality and how children are spiritual beings. Something that God recognized right from the beginning of time. If you think about that tribe and nation, the nation of Israel did not separate the children and the parents. When Ezra read the book of the law, everybody was there. The only time the kids got separated was when Jesus' self-righteous disciples said, oh, go away, kids. <laughs> what did Jesus say? These are key people. We're going to take a break now. There is some more wine. There is some passable drinkable coffee, I think, and <laughs> even some crisps and stuff. And we'll come back in about 10, 15 minutes and continue this. So, but if you do have to go because of babysitter issues, we understand. But uh, we're going to talk a bit more about practicalities and give you the chance to ask those questions to which we will say, never thought of that one. <laughs> Once there was a king. He was a great king. He was a marvelous king. He was the greatest king in all the world. And he was so fantastic that his name matched him. He was called Nebuchadnezzar. And he decided that he was going to build a statue. Not him himself. He was going to get the workers to do it. And so he called the palace architect together and he said, I want a statue built. I want a statue of me. I would like it to be um, 27 meters tall and covered in gold. One of the things I didn't do when I introduced myself was point out that I'm actually a storyteller. And one of the things that Carolyn and I have been doing this evening, that you've probably picked up very clearly, is we've been telling some of our story. And this is the way that Jesus communicated. He communicated by telling stories that reflected God. And what we've been trying to do this evening is to, to focus on God and how we communicate God to today's generation, whether they're grandchildren or children, whether they're teens or whether they're tinies. But I wonder what you can make of um, some of these pictures. Top left, that's that side. There are some characters 
Can you name many of them? Bagpuss. There's, there's the Wombles, yes. There's Noggin. Ivor the Engine, yes. Windy Miller, yes. And then top left, we're top left, Dolly. <laughs> There's a clanger, yes. Oh. No soup dragon, but a clanger. No, no and of course, Florence no no. Dougal and Boeing, said Zebedee. If you asked the children that you brought with you this evening, would they have identified any of those? They may have looked at either the engine and said, Thomas, the tank engine, with a spray job. <laughs> and one of the problems is that often we remember our childhood, a childhood that was in a different time. When I grew up in London, sweet rationing was still in force. When I grew up in London, the IRA were a real threat. In fact, I watched on television a couple of weeks ago pictures of a shop at the bottom of my road where IRA arms cash was found in the 1950s. <coughs> Children of today are living with a complete mess in the Far East a war in Afghanistan which sees people being brought home dead and children can't understand why we're doing that. And yet, if you look to the BBC website this week, you'll see we're still telling stories about Hitler and the Hun. The world today is very different. The world that our children inhabit is very different. And one of the practical problems that we have is that of our own perspective. I was telling somebody earlier on today as I travelled in on the bus this morning, um, there was this dad with his two five-year-olds on the bus. Sit down. They didn't take a blind bit of notice. The driver's watching you. They didn't respond at all. In the end, these two very young children just continued oblivious. And the, the friend who was sitting next to him was saying, my children are like that. They won't do as they're told. And yet for some of us, when you say to a child, jump, you expect them to say, please, can I come down now? <laughs> or how high would you like me to jump? There's a mismatch of expectations and experience which makes for very real practical problems. As I said, I grew up in a church environment where a 45-minute sermon was the norm. And that has conditioned my thinking and my understanding and my behavior. So we're going to, to move on to look at some more practical issues, which is a cue for you to get up, okay. twiddle your machine, which I really don't understand. Okay. Okay. And so, look at... <coughs> you can see that we are related, can't you? <laughs> there are certain characteristics about us. No, it's not Would true. <laughs> I too don't try and deny it. Um, there is masses and masses that we can talk about, um, but what um, we thought we'd do this evening is focus on three particular areas and then open up the floor for you to ask questions, for you to make suggestions of things that you've done in your own family that have worked that we can all benefit from. So we've chosen Bible, prayer and ritual. So we start off with Bible. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of children's Bibles and um, Bible storybooks and all sorts of things like that. 
it's not a stick to beat you with that you need to be right reading the Bible every day with your children however spirituality on its own is spirituality if we want children to have faith then they need to know the story you remembered those characters let's say 10 20 30 years after you were watching them on the telly they had a huge impact on your life as a child and you still remember them now wouldn't it be wonderful if instead of being desperate to get home and watch Arthur or um, Tracy Beaker Returns or Friday Download or whatever it is they're desperate to hear what happened next with David or they want to hear that story again of how Moses parted the Red Sea or they want to tell you the story that they heard Jesus say we want them to engage with God's story and there are lots of ways of doing that some of your children are readers and they'll read some of your children don't want to read um, and so it's ways of, of, of looking at that there is a book by I think it's called Karen Copley um, called God's story and it is the Bible written in a very novel type style it's still got chapters and there's a little bit in it that says um, this is Isaiah 40 to 42 or whatever but it is um, written in a storytelling style so if you are a family that gathers around a table at any point it's a great thing to have to read a chapter of because you know in the space of a year you can pretty much get through the whole Bible it takes out the um, so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so and how many um, centimeters of gold you need on this bit of the temple and that kind of stuff um, but it actually sort of um, tells the Bible as God's story there's another book called the book of books I'm not sure um, I haven't seen it around for a while it's orange it's about that big and he's written it in a, as a storyteller and I use the book of books quite often with all sorts of different age groups um, because he's written bits of the Bible so he may have taken a story from three of the Gospels and written it as a complete story in a storytelling way so it's just wonderful to read it's particularly good to read with sound effects so you give um, children maracas or spoons or saucepans or whatever you've got in your house and you read the story and they are the army marching or they are the wind and the rain and that kind of stuff. Um, this book here, it, this is a, I was, what's the word? <laughs> Unashamed. That's, this is an unashamed plug for a Scripps Union product. This is one of the best things I think they've produced for a long time. It's actually just won the Best Christian Children's Book of the Year Award. And it's called The Big Bible Challenge. And it's, um, I say Dorling Kindersley style, it makes Dorling Kindersley look dead and flat. Um, it's um, chunks of the Bible with um, interactive opportunities. Um, it's got um, fold-out bits, it's got amazing maps, it's got beautiful pictures, it's got questions, it's got opportunities to wonder. You can give it to a child to read and work their way through, or you can do it as a family. You can even take one of the pages and do it with a small group of children. Um, it's absolutely brilliant, and it brings the Bible to life, which is what um, we want for our children. Anyone doing anything with... Bible and children that they think the rest of us can benefit from or any got any questions like yeah all right okay but <laughs> yes it's called God's story and it's I think it's Karen something oh Karen Avery it might be Karen Avery it's blue as you can tell I'm a bit of a visual learner <laughs> The three-year-olds, um, um, again, sorry, it's an SU product, but the, um, the big Bible storybook, um, Bible stories told, and because they're Scripture Union, they are very keen on sticking to the truth of Scripture. 
Um, but they have worked very hard at making the stories applicable for um, under fives. Maggie Barfield, who um, was part of the editorial team, has written a spiritual development model for under fives, so she does know what she's talking about. And they're all puppets. Well, they, they're not actually puppets, they're dolls, because they haven't got holes up the bottoms. Um, and they, um, they sit and they're photographed. So it's, it's, um, and you can actually, I think you can actually get the puppets as well. Um, but it's a really tactile looking book. It's beautifully presented. The big, yeah, big Bible story book. If you have a look on the Scripture website, that'll be there. And so there are lots of ones around, but sometimes I've found with the sort of preschool ones, they're, they've got Noah, and that's about it. Um, and, you know, and actually, um, I believe the Bible is the Bible for God's reasons, and it includes bits that are tricky bits that are difficult, bits that are violent, bits that are rude. Um, and I think that actually, age appropriately, we, we need to include those bits. We can't just cherry pick bits out of it. Um, when I'm doing a transition program with year sixes, I either use the story of Joseph or I use the story of David. Sorry, I'll just twist my ankle. Um, so use the story of David. And in David, we're talking about adultery. Um, but I don't use the word adultery, um, and, I, and I get the kids off, and I have, you know, I have um, the smallest boy in the class is David, and then I say to the children, okay, who is the most beautiful girl in this class? And it's really interesting to watch the dynamics that go on. And this girl comes up, and sometimes she's like, and other times she's like, oh, gosh, that's so embarrassing. And she, I put a headband on her that says, babe. And we carry on the story. And un unfortunately, 90% of the children have never heard this story before. So they have no idea that I've set them up for an ambush. Um, and then we get to the stage, and you know, they're, you know, they're 11, they're just about to leave school. It's all a bit difficult. And then I go, and then David was walking around the roof of his, pa uh, his palace, and he saw the most beautiful woman on the planet, and he really wanted to snog her. And that's sufficient for an 11-year-old. That is disgusting enough. You don't have to go into any more detail. Yeah? And, then, and then you can see David going, <laughs> and all his mates going, <laughs> um, and then we say, it's okay, we're not doing that bit. And we talk about the consequences of the choices and the fact that David took something that didn't belong to him. Because we have Uriah as well, and Uriah goes off to war and gets, get, gets killed. Um, and we, so we, 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 we don't avoid the, the real story, but we don't use language that is going to um, give them more information that they need at the age they're at. Um, so again, you know, don't be frightened of looking at some of the stories that are um, a little bit more fruity, should we say. Uh, and coming back to the, the younger ones, fuzzy felt. Mm. Fuzzy felt is a wonderful way of telling stories. You can still get fuzzy felt in all good toy shops. And one of the sort of the, the things that came out of America has been godly play. I don't know if you know anything about godly play. But basically, the, the idea is you get the children to tell you the story. They rehearse the story. And then you do, I wonder. I wonder what would have happened. What do you think would have happened if Adam had said, no thanks, I'm a carnivore, I don't eat vegetables. What would have happened if Lot's wife hadn't turned back? Because one of the ways that we internalize these narratives, these historical events, is by rehearsing them and thinking of, yes, you've heard it before, the consequences, the outcomes. And it also helps the children to understand that the stories are about real people in real time and people who were just as they are. Okay. Any more thoughts or questions on Bible? Um, what we find in our family is that we've started lots of things with good intentions and it's been brilliant for a while and then something happens and it fades out and, and I guess I shouldn't be too surprised because it happens with my own Bible review too. Mm. But how do you keep going and avoid those problems? Okay. 
I think, I think you accept the troughs. Mm. One of the things that I'm going to talk about when we talk about ritual is the troughs. Um, and the reality is it, the, your children are changing all of the time and their tastes and things are changing. And I was thinking back to, um, we used to read Every Day with Jesus um, around the table in Lingfield. It wasn't Every Day with what Jesus. Was it? it was a stories Jesus told or stories, something, like, something that. like that. Yeah. I learned all of the birds of Great Britain during that because they were on a poster on the wall by the kitchen table. Yeah? Troughs. Um, so you, you, your children are changing all the time. I think the thing is, is try something. And if it lasts for a while, that's great. But there are seasons and reasons and move on. Um, so over the years I've tried, which is why I know that there's, you know, the Karen Avery book and the other things, because over the years we've tried different things. Um, at the moment with a 16 and a 15 year old, I'm struggling to get them to engage on a weekly basis, if anything more than that. Um, but my 11-year-old still is reasonably happy to sit and read a very small bit. Um, we've got a, it's just literally chunks of the Bible um, and a couple of questions. And if he's in the mood, we'll do that. But if he's not in the mood, then we don't. So, you know, don't worry about that. Be, be happy to try lots of different things and, and celebrate what happens for the time and, and accept that sometimes things change. Yeah, uh, I think the key is you don't beat yourself up over it. Mm because that makes you feel guilty you then force the rest of the family to do something and you've got resistance you've got all sorts of other issues your job as a parent as a grandparent is to love them mm. that is the most important thing love them you know in a lot of families you know the issue is do we play football on sunday morning or not well, some churches have said, okay, fine, we will have a church service at four o'clock. And there's a church I know in Surrey that has a 10 o'clock service, an 11.30 service, a four o'clock service, and a seven o'clock service. And they have four different congregations. Um, because it's the real world. Now, we're going to move on to, to look at, at ritual, which perhaps in a building like this might seem slightly odd. Um, Okay, I just, someone else had a question here. So the Sorry. Time. No? To put the hand up. No, I, I'm just going to say, going back to what you said about um, what would have happened if, what about, you know, your, the disciples are in the boat with Jesus in the storm? How would you feel? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, 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 definitely. Getting them to relate to those feelings. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, particularly for boys, that's two steps away. Um, and so it's, it's waiting. We were having a conversation about, um, about boys um, during the break. And it's sometimes you have to persevere with something and wait on them. Um, one of the things that came out of the research um, for me was the fact that um, boys do, you know, we say boys don't have feelings or boys don't talk about things. They do, but only in certain circumstances. And most of the time, boys only talk about things with boys. Um, they don't want to talk about them with girls. Um, they want to talk about them with boys. Um, but sometimes when, when you untap that, that how does it feel, you get an awful lot. But it's sometimes it's asking the question and being prepared for there not to be a verbal answer. But there may be a huge thing going on inside them that you don't know about. So again, it's trusting. And it's, again, it's, it's about handing back, isn't it? And saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to put the vehicle in in their way i'm going to ask the questions that help them to think about how they feel how they think and i just have to trust that you're doing the process and it's very easy to try to phrase the question immediately if they don't say anything yes yes yeah mm. Mm. Yes, yeah. And that's the, you know, the, the beauty of the I wonder, because it doesn't have a right or a wrong. And, and um, you know, many children spend their, their lives feeling wrong because they put their hand up and they get the wrong answer or they don't put their hand up and then they're told off for not putting their hand up. And, and actually, by I wonder, you give them the opportunity for it not to be wrong. Um, and, but you do need to give them the space as well for that. And fi finally, on, on this... The family car is a great place for conversations mm. because there's no eye contact. And it is quite important that 
you use that rather than have the sort of the CD player or the video or whatever. You know, just listen and, and talk. Mm -hmm. But ritual. I think we're doing prayer in between. Prayer, is yeah, it? Yeah, we're doing prayer, prayer in between. Oh, yes, it's the grass, isn't it? <coughs> yes. yes, yeah. Right. Um, grazing prayers, I call them. This idea that... Um, Sometimes you see children are very formalized in their prayer. So it's like we say, we're going to say grace and I have to, I have to put my hands like this and I have to close my eyes and I have to do this and I have to do that. Now it's, there is time when it's appropriate for them to put those actions in to show the focus of their minds and their hearts. But if we're talking about relationship with Jesus and we're actually encouraging them to think in terms of Jesus being with them wherever they are, then in the same way that we would have conversations, we need to bring Jesus into that. And so what I mean by grazing prayers are the ideas that as you're walking to school and you say, what have you got today? And they say, oh, I've got a mass test and I hate mass. You say, okay, um, Lord Jesus, you know that Ben hates mass. Um, and we're just asking you to be with him while he has that mass test today. Help him to find all the answers that, you know, he's got in his head and give him your peace. Amen. And you're still walking and you haven't stopped. You haven't created a, um, a sense of because actually what you're doing is you're, you're intimating to the child, well, Jesus is walking with us, and we're, we're doing that um, together with him. He's here. And again, that sense for a child who does live in an imaginative world, well, if Jesus has walked to school with us, then he'll walk into the playground with me as well. So the idea of just bringing prayers naturally into um, the conversation. Um, and, you know, and again, it goes back to that thing I was saying about honesty. You know, sometimes it's okay to stand in the kitchen and go, oh, God, I can't do this anymore. I'm not saying we do that all the time, but sometimes, you know, we're saying to God, this is really hard, and our children are seeing us wrestling with, with that, yeah? Um, and again, you know, something fantastic happens. The cakes come out of the oven, and we go, thank you, Lord, for delicious cakes, I'm first, or whatever. So actually just bringing, bringing it in. One of the other um, key things I discovered in my research, and it's... Uh, essentially, there's very little difference between how boys engage with their spirituality or express their spirituality and how girls do it. There's a wide spectrum, but what we've done, as I said earlier, is narrowed it down to a particular way of doing it, which girls are okay with, but some boys find hard. The only major difference in all the research that I did, and I got results from quite a few um, hundred children, is prayer. And it was so significantly different that I had to go back to all the research and recount everything. And it's about the idea that boys pray quietly on their own. Now we know, if you've ever sat in a circle with boys, that they don't pray in a group. But I have got masses of video evidence of boys talking about their prayer lives. And in the book, I talk about my, my very dear friend who, when I said, this is what I'm discovering, she's got two boys, burst into tears. And they were tears of relief. Because she said, every night, I go into Ollie's room and I try to make him pray with me. And he says, mum, go away. And I'm worried that he's going to go to hell. <laughs> I'm like, no, actually, I know that Ollie prays because he's told me all about it. That doesn't let us off the hook. It doesn't mean that we go, oh, well, boys are praying on their own, therefore we don't need to encourage them to pray corporately or we don't need to encourage them. But we do need to give them tools. And that wall is one of the tools. Because if they're praying quietly on their own in their room, maybe you set up pictures on the wall of the things that they want to pray for so they can cut things out of newspapers and magazines or put photos of family and friends or their pets or whatever on the wall and that becomes their prayer wall so that you're giving them the tools. You can do the same in a large group. Give them the opportunity to, to picture the things that they want to pray about and they don't have to say a word, but it is there. So it's thinking about ways that we can resource their private prayer. 
Um, and still, it's appropriate for us sometimes um, to say, no, we are going to say a prayer together now before I leave your bedroom. Um, sometimes I, um, I talk about um, the sort of um, the quitting prayer. Um, so the getting them into bed and going, dear Lord Jesus, thank you very much for today. And... <laughs> Um, so that <laughs> I feel I've done my duty and they feel that they've been prayed for, but actually there was something on the television or whatever it was that I needed to exit quickly. Um, praying as a, a family doesn't have to be a chore. It can be a very quick thing. Lots of children do like to say grace um, around a meal. Sometimes that becomes a little bit of a monologue. Um, <laughs> but, you know, thinking again creatively of ways that you can pray quickly but meaningfully in your family. So any ideas or thoughts that you've used that um, have worked for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good. They've obviously got a huge sense of, of compassion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really good. So yeah, just seizing those moments, isn't it? And the more we get into the habit, um, the more natural it is. So again, if things they might have seen on television, you know, News Round, I think is a very, very good program. Um, and that's a, a really good opportunity to do that. As they get older, um, other programs that you're watching with them, and I really would encourage you to watch television mm. with them and know what they're watching. Um, my excuse for not going to my Wednesday night home group for quite a long time was because Waterloo Road was on and my teenage daughters were watching it and I had to watch it with them. And it seemed to work for me. <laughs> but seriously, it meant that we talked about teenage pregnancy, alcohol, drugs, all sorts of things very naturally. We didn't have a, now let's sit down and I'm going to talk to you about, because it came out of, of that. So it's using those, those opportunities. And if they are worried about something, to immediately turn it um, to prayer. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. No, candles are a really good thing. And so we're moving on to ritual now. And I think, you know, the ritual of lighting candle, having our candle time, even if it is just a time of silence and looking at it, is really very effective. Um, in the um, Sunday morning group that I do, we have, um, we have five to tens. We have anywhere between 10 and 35 um, in a very large, horrible hall. Um, and so sometimes I'll have a candle lit as they come in, so that they come in and they gather around the candle, and that just helps them to, to see it as a sacred space. Um, fire is also brilliant. If you can light a fire together... Um, that's such a magic spiritual experience because you've, you know, you've, you've used the wonderful things that God has given us to make fire and it's very exciting and it's very dangerous. So it's even better. Um, and, um, and then you sit and you toast marshmallows or you toast your wellies or whatever it is. And again, you're sitting and you're looking at the fire. So there's no eye contact and you can share and you can, you know, again, you've got opportunities for silence, which isn't uncomfortable because there's a lot of noise in a fire. Um, you can watch the things, you can wonder, you can say, that's my prayer, that little spark that's going up is, is my prayer. Which one's yours? What are you, who are you praying for? And, and just, you know, sort of use those, those things as a, a really um, wonderful activity. Um, of course, all, you know, risk assessment aside and all of that. Okay. So, yeah, so ritual, I think, is really important in family life. Um, as we said earlier, there are going to be peaks and troughs. And um, for, for me, as I said earlier, I'm a little bit obsessed with Christmas. And Advent, um, I've discovered over the years, is a really fantastic opportunity for us to have family rituals. But they have changed. So when the children were little, we had an advent calendar that had all of the animals. Now, how they managed to get 24 different animals into the stable, I do not know. But each animal had a story 
um, a bit of the Bible story associated with it. So we would put the mouse in and the mouse had eaten something to do with the Bible. I can't remember it now, but you know, they'd, um, and then we would put the next day, we'd put the donkey in and we'd hear about them coming to um, Bethlehem and that sort of stuff. And what we did is we'd light a candle. We'd have an Advent candle. We'd light it. We'd then read the bit of the Bible story. We'd put the Advent calendar um, piece in. And um, we might say a little prayer and we might watch the candle. Or we might get into a conversation and then realize that we'd burnt two days of the Advent candle down. Um, But we would do that every day as part of bedtime. Now, as I say, my (laughs) my 17-year-old and my 15-year-old were still awake when I went to bed last night. So we don't do bedtime anymore in the way that we did. Um, But what we do now at Advent is we do a weekly thing. So we burn four days (laughs) of the Advent candle. Um, And I've got these um, little Christmas decorations that are various characters from the Christmas story. And, you know, one of them takes them out of the basket and they then tell me that part of the Christmas story. And we'll sort of just talk about it. And we do that once a week. But it is our Advent ritual. So, so you know, don't worry if things have changed. Don't worry if, if you think, well, we're not doing it every day, therefore it's not. It's still, it's still part of, of the rituals. Um, finding space as a family to meet together as well. You know, I was saying how important belonging and experiencing love is. Time, for many children, is one of their key love languages. Um, And, you know, um, it's finding a space to be a family together. Now, I know that this is not often easy. And I think it does get harder as your children get older. Um, But it's finding ways to to do that. And um, we were very, very blessed by the Scripture Union Family Activity Planner. And I have to be very careful how I say it, because otherwise it becomes the Scripture Union Family Planner. Um, (laughs) And um, it was a brilliant, brilliant product, because what it did was it had a family calendar with a column for each person in the family, and then it had a Bible verse, a thought about it, and an activity that you did. And so we would have what we called family meeting, and we would have a meal... And then we would get out the planner. We'd normally do it on a Sunday night. And um, we'd um, get out the planner. We'd read the Bible. We'd check who who was going where, when, and how who was going to pick it up, and all of that kind of stuff. Plan the week. Pray for the week. And then the family meeting was over. Um, And that was a wonderful time in our family life. Now, the children are at youth group on a Sunday night. So we are really struggling and looking for other times in the week to find that. But if you can find a time that you can get together once a week um, just to, to sort of um, bond and, and, and create that sense of belonging um, and, you know, to pray or to engage with the Bible together as well. And then finally, creative rituals as well. You have got rituals in your family that you don't know our rituals. Some of them you do know that you always go to aunties on the third Thursday of, um, but some of them um, it's worth thinking about um, sort of celebrating it and, and holding fast to it. Some of the things that you do need to be held fast onto for the children's sake. They will demand it. So this is representative of our Easter treasure hunt. So many, many years ago, in a moment of madness, I decided that because I was concerned about the, um, the need for chocolate at Easter, that I would be a good Christian parent and I would set up a treasure hunt for my children so they could find the real treasure of Easter. And I designed, I had very tiny, quite tiny, and a little bit older. So I did three treasure hunts, age-appropriate treasure hunts. And I must have had all the time in the world at that stage. And hid all these clues around the house. And then they ran around and they had to answer questions. And, they, and then they came and we all shared these Easter story. And it was all very, very beautiful. And they loved it so much that they demanded it the next year. This year, <laughs> they still demanded it. And I had to do it because that was what they wanted for them. It's a really important part of Easter. Um, I did cheat a little bit, and I said to the 17-year-old, right, you're writing the questions this year. Um, and, you know, we're, we sort of did it um, a bit um, together. Um, but, it, you know, it's an opportunity for them um, to, uh, 
tell the story, um, but also it's part of their story in our family. And so I suspect that when they are 30, I'll still be creating treasure hunts. I've run out of hiding places. Um, there's only so many ways you can describe a washing machine. Um, <clears throat> but, but it's something that's really important to them. So have a, have a think, have a chat about what are the things in your family life that say we are this family and this is how we express how we belong together. And, and if you can't find any, think of some. What can we do that says we are this family, we belong, and we are part of God's family as well? And how do we bring him in? At one stage, we used to, um, we used to have a setting place for God. Um, because somebody just, you know, had listened at some stage and said, well, if um, God is in our house, then he needs to have a place at the table. And so we had a place setting for God. It didn't last very long, but at that point, that was, that was helpful for them um, in their thinking. So, so what is it that you need to do to encourage them? Any other thoughts on rituals? I think once you, you move into the generation that I'm in, the sort of the, uh, the old people's group, things do change because you don't have that regular contact with the children. You don't have the sort of the day-by-day -day thing. But you do have something that your grandchildren may well appreciate, and that's secret knowledge of their parents. <laughs> hmm. And when it comes to telling the family story... As long as you're not sort of um, diminishing the parent, then why not say yes? Your mum felt like that when she was your age. Mm. And also, as, as a grandparent, hopefully you've got that bit of time, that bit of distance. You're not worrying about getting the food on the table. You're not worrying about getting the washing sorted and all those practical things. And so when the grandchildren are there, you actually have time for them. And time to tell them your story. What your childhood was like. What was special for you as a child. And to, to share something of your Christian experience. It's not a sort of potted testimony, but it's just sort of saying, well, yeah, I, I can remember what one day I was really worried because my doll's armor dropped off. And so I, I prayed and my aunt came in and she got one of these hook things and managed to repair it. You know, a practical outcome, those sorts of, of practical things. Now, I'm conscious that we're sort of rattling through, through time, so I'm going to ask Carolyn to grab a chair and come and sit down. This is my chair. You grab a chair. Oh, I've got to get my own chair. <sighs> because it would, would be un, unfair to, to send you home with your eye, head sort of buzzing with all sorts of things and no opportunity to ask that question that you want to. So if you do have a question you want to ask, we will happily consider it. We may not be able to answer it. We're realists. You may have something that you are desperately concerned about that we've not covered, that we've not said. So the floor is open and we will sit here and we will quite happily sit here quietly for a while. Um, we are going to have our own ritual to finish with as well. Uh, but uh, I shut up. No, I, I think what one thing, while you're, you're thinking, mm. I think what one thing you can do is you can actually use your nine and seven-year-old to create something for the three-year-old so, so that their experience, their skills are called into play. Maybe they do a puppet um, show, they um, tell a story or, or something like, like that. Or if it's a craft activity, that it's something that 
it doesn't really matter if you are a budding Picasso or you're a, a Van Gogh because you know, it's something that you can do at your own level. Mm. I was going to say that. Sorry? I was going to say that. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. I think, first of all, don't ever underestimate the power of a praying grandparent mm. um, or the power of uh, praying anyone. Um, let's say our story again. Um, my mother was um, sent to Dr. Bernardo's. Um, her dead father's brother was a Christian and prayed for his nephews and nieces that he had no idea where they were in the world. And he prayed and prayed and prayed. And all three of them... Um, became Christians and were found and, and survived the trauma that they went through. So don't ever underestimate that, um, because that is your gift to them. Um, again, you know, talking about your experience um, and what it means to you, um, and, and in short bursts as well. So again, it's, it's a natural walking along, you know, they, you go, I don't know, look at some flowers somewhere, and, you, and it's one sentence. You know, that you say, gosh, isn't that beautiful? I am so grateful to God for making that and move on. And they, and they, can, then t they can then take that as well. I think, you know, they, I think the questioning phase lasts a lot longer than Westerhoff would have us believe. Um, I think that a lot of people um, start it at 12 and keep it on until their 30s. Um, I think one of the key times is actually when you have your own children. I think that's when, um, or when something big happens, you have a big loss. Um, so there will be, there will still be opportunities where they'll, they'll go. And because of the little gems that you've put in their pathway, they'll go, ah, oh, yeah, granny or nan or whatever you're called. She knows about that. Or go and ask her about that. Um, so yeah, don't be discouraged. Do just keep putting those little diamonds in all of the time about your experience and what it means to you. But I, I think we, we do have to weep with God and acknowledge that there are some people who just turn their back on, on God. It breaks our heart and it breaks God's heart too. Um, it doesn't stop us living in hope. And I'm not talking wishful thinking, I'm talking real biblical hope. Mm. Um, but ultimately everybody has to take responsibility for themselves. Mm. And just as we see people that we know that we work with get themselves in a, into a mess um, and we feel helpless it's much the same I'm afraid with our own family sometimes um, my sister died last summer must be about now mustn't it yeah, last yeah. year and um, the local minister went to see her and she said to him I don't mind talking to you but you're not going to talk about God are you mm. and he when he was presiding at her funeral, he told this story. Um, but as he said, we don't know. We know that she rejected me. And, you know, it's just the, the way that the world is, sadly. Mm. Um, it's really hard when it is boring. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, and in fact, I just join in. <laughs> I can go, boring! Um, I think it's, it's having another, uh, enough other tools. So if you are in a situation where it is boring, it's, um, yeah, finding other things that you can engage them with. So... Again, depending on their age and, and their own 
preferences, asking them questions or getting them to draw pictures. That, um, there's a book called, um, Pre is it Preaching the Gospel to Children? Sharing the Gospel to Children. Gretchen Pritchard Wolf's one. Sharing the Gospel. Anyway, in that, she talks about pew art. And um, what she says is that um, in all age worship, that isn't all age, um, if you leave children with enough paper and enough pens and coloring bits and pieces, then you'll often see what's coming out in the sermon coming out in their art. Now, that's not saying that every day, you know, they'll sit through a sermon and they'll produce something of deep theological significance. Um, probably most of the time they'll draw cars or rabbits or whatever it is that they can draw or that they enjoy drawing. But actually just giving them that is, is sometimes enough. Um, but again, I mean, I've had tiny little cars that have got quiet wheels in my handbag. I've still, still got some actually in my handbag. Um, because, they, you can, because they're tiny, you can move them quite a long way along the pew without actually moving your body. Um, and again, it's, it's finding things that engage the children's hands but free up the mind. So, so whilst they're coloring, whilst they're moving cars around, they're listening and they're taking it in at their level. Um, but in terms of the it's boring, I don't want to go, that's, that is a really tricky thing. Um, and that's where we have to be so grateful for all of the hundreds and thousands of children's workers and youth workers who are working really hard to make it interesting. And so sometimes you have to, um, you have to sort of accept um, that they're not going to get something a a every week, perhaps. One of the things that I did in response to the It's Boring um, was one Sunday morning, um, we were sitting on the stairs, and I'm doing the, come on, we need to go to church, and it's boring, and I say, yes, it is boring. Um, and so I said, okay, well, let's go and do church on the hill. And so what we did was we took um, one of those Bible story books that I was telling you about, a flask of hot chocolate and the dog, and we went up to um, a sort of high spot outside of our town. And we sat on a blanket, and we climbed trees first, um, and then we chased the dog around, and then we um, sat on the blanket, and we drank hot chocolate, and we read the Bible, we talked about it, and we prayed while, with our eyes open, because there were people walking past. So we prayed like this, like, we're not really praying, I'm being embarrassing, we're, pray we're, we're doing this. And they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And so sometimes we do get a, can we do church on the hill rather than um, church and church? And sometimes you have to go, actually, for my family, at this moment, that's more important than, than going. But yeah, it, is, I, it is hard. I, I think if it's possible sort of to engage with them and say, well, what is boring? And it may be that you have to go to the church leadership team and say, look, this is a genuine concern that we, because the children are part of the mm. church today. Mm. Um, and also, there is the other side that we need to be honest and say there are times when we find it boring. And yet, there is a great comfort in that familiarity. You know, if I was to, to start, you know, dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places, then lots of you are already sort of with me because that was part of your boring experience. Mm. But it, it sort of lasted. And all of us also have to accept that there are boring things that we do. You go and sit and wait in the dentist's waiting room and it is boring. You just have to live with it. Maths tests can be boring, apparently. You know, so, uh, and again, it, it's part of the dialogue that, that we have with our, our children about life and accepting that it isn't all fun and games and laughing and dancing. It is boring having to think of something to feed you with day <laughs> after day, week after week. It is boring having to turn your socks inside the right way. You know, all those facts of life. Okay. I think we're probably reaching the end of our time, aren't we? So thank you very much um, for coming this evening. And... Um, you know, continue 
to to wrestle with these things, to think about these things. And you know, as I said, we've we've really just scratched the surface of um, the wonder that it is of being a parent and a grandparent and being part of God's family um, and sharing with these children. So do continue to to think about these things and to share them with each other as well. Um, and our ritual. And our ritual. And our ritual. Because we've, we've come together as, as a group of people. Some of us know each other. Some of us are, are complete strangers. And we've come with somebody on our heart. Child, grandchild, whatever. I'm going to ask us just to sit quietly and to to bring that name to God in the silence of this building. And we're going to say thank you. Sorry, you missed that. We're going to say thank you. That means you say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, and you say thank you. Thank you. Because we want to thank God for that person. Mm -hmm. For all their idiosyncrasies, all their oddities, all their wonderfulness. And in the quiet we're going to ask God to bless them. And we're going to say together, Amen. Amen.